Hi, Kristen. Hi. Good to see you. You too. Hello, everyone. We're letting everyone in now. Thanks for joining us today. All right. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our TA talk today on communication and program promotion and volunteer recruitment. Uh, my name is Katie O'Hearn, and I am the Program and Outreach Manager at NORC. And before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. So next slide. So these TA talks are informal quarterly calls on specific topics. So today our topic is communication tools. And these calls are hosted on Zoom and they're live streamed on Facebook. And you're encouraged to share your expertise and experience during these calls to provide peer-to-peer -peer support um, and learn from each other. So since this is a Zoom meeting rather than a Zoom webinar, there'll be an opportunity for you to unmute yourself and ask questions over audio, um, or you can type in your questions over chat. This meeting is being recorded and the recording and PowerPoint will be emailed to everyone once this has ended. Um, and then at the end of the meeting, please be sure to complete the evaluation. Uh, this really helps us plan for future trainings. And then you will be emailed a certificate of participation for attending this meeting if you attend over Zoom for at least 30 minutes. And then all links and resources will be posted in the chat and on, and on our website. So if you like these and if you have an idea for a future TA talk, please be sure to email us um, and we can see if we can get it on the calendar. Um, for a future call. Next slide. So on the call today, we have, we're lucky to have media experts, Kristen Hyde and Katie Hewitt. So Kristen and Katie presented during our January webinar on communication and media relations. So I hope you all are thinking of questions for them. I'm going to share a few resources and then we'll open up the call and for a discussion so you can ask them questions and ask each other questions on this topic. Next slide. So quickly, here's the agenda for today. Like I said, I'll start off by sharing some free and low cost online communication tools that can be used for program promotion and volunteer recruitment. And then I will quickly remind everyone of a few resources that NORC has on our website um, that we also shared during the January webinar. And then we'll open it up for a discussion so you can ask Katie and Kristen some questions. Next slide. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about the communication tools. Next slide. Thanks, Libby. Um, so I wanted to quickly provide an overview of the purpose of communicating online and some outlets you can use that you can use the tools I'm going to mention on. So communicating online can be free and or low cost, and you're also able to access a wide audience. So some tools that you can use, which I'll go deeper into, are your website. Um, you can post resources, updates, job opportunities for new volunteers, and things like that. Um, you can use email for lengthy messages. You can create a list listserv for people to join, and you can use email to send monthly or quarterly newsletters or share information. And then you can use social media. So usually the purpose of social media is to remind people and reframe information. So some ways you can do that are by sharing images and videos, highlight a stat or a quote, highlight some of your representatives in your program. You can pose a question to your audience and then answer the question. Um, you can also relate to current events that are happening. So now I'm going to share some tools that you can use to do all of this with. Next slide. So this slide just has links to the tools that I want to share with you. Um, I use most of these tools in my daily work and we've learned about some of these websites from ombudsman programs. So if you have a website or something that you use to help promote your program, uh, we, occur we encourage you to share it with us. So, I mean, we can use it and we can share it with other people as well. Next slide. So, 
The first tool is Canva, which is used for graphic design. I personally use this website daily. I'm not a graphic designer, but it this website is one of the most user-friendly platforms for graphic design. Um, Canva is accessed as a website or an app, and it lets you design visual materials without needing extensive graphic design experience. So pe people will typically use Canva for social media graphics. They'll create you can create simple videos, presentations, posters, and other visual assets. If you have a brochure you want to create for your program, something like that, you can make it on Canva. Next slide. So this is the only tool I'm sharing that has multiple slides because I love Canva so much. Um, so Canva has a wide range of customizable templates. So if you're looking for a poster that looks like a timeline, you just go on the website and you type that in, poster with timeline. And several templates will pop up with different colors and designs. So on the right, you'll see this is a resource that I created on Canva for NORC. Um, and so this was a template that was already in Canva and I just changed the colors and I changed the text and picked images from their image library. And just as a side note, I just want to mention this resource since it's on the screen. Um, this is a checklist that provides a step by step um, checklist for new ombudsmen to learn about NORC. So it includes links to important web pages on our website and resources and information about the program and how to sign up for our emails. And then it also has our email address if new ombudsmen have technical assistance questions. So if you hire a new representative or work with volunteers, you can include this resource in their materials once they start their initial training. So back to Canva, um, I mentioned that they have a library of royalty-free images. So on this resource, I searched laptop and then that laptop came up and I just selected it. So royalty free means that you can use these images for any purpose. Um, you can edit them and use them for your needs without paying for them. Um, so unlike traditional graphic design tools like Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop, Canva's learning curve is designed to be very easy and the pricing is considerably lower than Illustrator or Pho Photoshop. Next slide. And then, so this is just more examples of graphics that you may have seen from NORC that were created in Canva. So these are all email headers for either webinars or surveys. Um, so every time we have a webinar, we'll make something in Canva and then put it in an email. Okay, next slide. So the next tool I wanted to mention our stock photos. So if you want to use high quality images that look like a professional took them in your materials, you'll need stock images. Um, so stock images are original images taken by photographers who then allow you to use them for your work and reuse for different purposes. So on this slide, um, you'll see links to three different websites that offer royalty free images. So meaning you can use any of the photos on that website for free. So you just search what you're looking for and then a whole library of images will come up and they're really high quality. So I do not suggest using any images you find on Google because you do not necessarily have permission to use them. So you wanna to stick to images from stock photo websites that you know you're allowed to use for those purposes. And there are, since these three websites are free, they offer free images, um, but there are also websites where you can purchase stock photos. So if you're not finding anything you like on these websites, you can visit uh, websites like Shutterstock or Getty Images. And the average cost of a photo on there is like for a blog or a website is maybe around $10. Next slide. So the next tool that I use in my work is um, called flat icon. So if you're looking for just a simple icon to use in your materials or on your website, I found that this website flat icon has a wide catalog of icons. So there's free icons are available to download in a PNG format, which just means it's best for digital use has and has a transparent background. Um, but if you would like to download icons in additional formats, there's a subscription option for $13 a month where you can download icons in additional formats. So we use these on our website, in our printed materials, on social media to make things graphically interesting. 
And the free subscription allows you to download 10 icons per day, but if you have a paid subscription, you can download 2,000 per day. And one of my favorite things about this website is you can download icons in packs. So all of the icons will have the same style and look to them. So if you search green quotation mark, you'll see packs of icons that all look similar to the green quotation mark. So I don't know if you can see it in this screenshot. All of um, these icons have the similar green going on with them. They have the same style. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that Canva has a video feature where you can create presentations, which I've used before and it's nice. It looks like a slideshow. Um, you can add music. Another option to create video is called Powtoon. And we learned about Powtoon from an ombudsman program and we've used them in our work as well. And in another slide, I wanna show you guys a video, um, an example of a Powtoon created by the Louisiana Ombudsman Program. So in Powtoon, um, you can create a presentation and they have a library of animation clips, some live action videos, images. They have designed backgrounds and moving graphics that you can use to put together an animation. And then they also have music, so you can use their soundtracks and music, or you can upload your own voiceover if you want to do a training and you want to be the one talking. So there is a free option and their subscription option is 288 a year. And I think they have some other, like it's levels, they have other subscriptions that cost more, but that do more. And then if you want to watch this later, I linked an example on this slide of a Powtoon we created on residence rights. It's just about a minute long. Okay, the next tool, this is, I think this is the last one I wanted to mention, was email. So we don't use MailChimp or Constant Contact in our work, but these are two common email marketing tools that ombudsman programs have told us that they use. So email marketing is one of the best tools to reach a wide audience. So an email marketing service like MailChimp or Constant Contact will help you collect and manage your subscribers, and then you can send your emails to subscribers. They both offer templates and design features that allow you to create and schedule your emails ahead of time. And they both offer free and subscri subscription services. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I just wanted to share a few examples from ombudsman programs. So next slide. So this is um, a Powtoon that was created by the Louisiana Ombudsman Program. And then there's also a link on this slide to a Powtoon that was created by the Arizona Program. So I just quickly wanted to play the Louisiana one, just so you can see an example of what a video would look like. So. Thanks. So I think that that's just a different way to get across information so they can share that video on their social media pages, they can put it in an email and it's captivating it's and it's quick. Um, and everything in that video you can use for free so they just added their the text that they wanted, but all the music and all the images are included with um, a Powtoon account. So, thanks. Next slide. So another idea for promoting your program are yard signs. And I think we've mentioned this before, but 
These were created by the Missouri Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. So if you wanted to create a sign like this to give to your representatives to put in their yard, you can create it on something like Canva. Um, it looks nicer than using a Word document to do any graphic work. And then you can take an image or take a photo of all your representatives with their sign and um, put it on social media. And that's where this heart came from, was from their social, social media page. So just an idea to use Canva um, in a creative way. Next slide. So this is a brochure created by the Louisiana Ombudsman Program on residents' rights. So this is just another example of a material that you can create using Canva flat icon, or you can add a stock image in here. And then finally, I just want to spend a couple minutes highlighting some of NORC's resources on program promotion. Promotion. So this will just serve as a reminder because we talked about these during the January webinar. On the first page of our website, or the, I'm sorry, the first page of our website that I want to highlight is our program promotion webpage. So on this page, you can find examples of promotional materials from ombudsman programs, such as their social media pages, and you can get an idea of what type of content other programs are posting. You can see what type of videos they're creating. We have links to their YouTube channels, so you can see what type of volunteer recruitment videos or training videos they're putting out there. We also have examples of their annual annual reports, their brochures, posters, newsletters. And then we have examples of media outreach trainings that programs have done, such as presentation, a presentation from Texas called All Things Media, which includes an example press release. And then this video can be used for program promotion. It provides an overview of the purpose of the Ombudsman program. So this video includes a link to our find a long-term care ombudsman map page. So it is a picture of the country and then people can click on their state and then find an ombudsman program near them. So anyone can use this video and they can find your program. Next slide. Um, this postcard is available on our website for you to print off and you can bring it into facilities. So there's three versions of it on our website and it can be used by an ombudsman program or facilities to share information about the program. And you can personalize the postcards and print them off and share them with residents and family members. And this is an infographic. It provides a brief overview of the work ombudsman programs do and the impact they have around the nation. This infographic is numbers focused, so it has a lot of data in it. And it can be used for volunteer recruitment and program promotion. And then finally, this fact sheet walks through what the ombudsman program is, what the program does and does not do, and then it has information on residents' rights and some other FAQs about the program. Great. Okay, so I would like to now open it up for a discussion for you to ask each other and Kristen and Katie, our media experts, about any questions you have on this topic. So Libby, you can stop sharing the slides, and if anyone has any questions, um, or anything they want to talk about, any tools that you use that we didn't mention, you can unmute or you can add links to them in the chat. And also to start off, I wanna ask Kristen and Katie if there's anything you think I missed or anything you would suggest as a free or low cost tool programs can use. I thought those were great examples. Thanks for sharing those, Katie. Those were Terrific. I would love to talk about a free one too for icons. Your icon one is awesome. There's another one out there called the Noun Project. Not sure if you've used that one before. Um, it, I, they have, um, it can be relatively cheaper, I think. They also do those packs but you can customize each of them. So with, if you know the RGB or the hex, you know, the color code, you can just type that in and it will produce that same icon in exactly the color that you want. So just an alternative. I think the one that you shared is awesome. That's just another alternative that's out there. 
That's amazing. I wrote that down because I don't think the one I shared can do that. So that's wonderful. <laughs> it's a good one. I like it. Does anyone listening have any suggest? Oh, someone said in the chat, can you say it one more time? It's the a name. noun, the noun project. I'll put it in the chat. Great. Thanks. Does anyone have any tools that they use in their work or know that their program uses? Or do you use any of the ones that I mentioned? If you think of well, anything. Anybody, well, I'm, I'm just starting, right? I just um, be, became the volunteer coordinator for my program. So I'm just trying to get ideas on how to recruit volunteers. It's, it's like, where's the starting point? <laughs> Does anyone want to answer? I don't I don't want us to I want it to be a group effort to answering. Anyone have any suggestions? Where do you start? Is anyone else a coordinator? No. Well, I well, think I'm gonna just say I am gonna reach out to our social media team to see if I could get something created to put the buzz out there to let people know that I am recruiting for volunteers. Anything else? Yeah, I, I'm gonna jump, jump in. Kristen, I thought you did a really fantastic job um, with getting some messages out on transit. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of cities and um, a lot of cities have uh, free advertising if you are a nonprofit organization. Um, I'm not sure if Sound Transit, if uh, you were able to participate in that program with Sound Transit here in the um, King County region, but that is something that is a free, if you just research it like Google, um, free uh, advertising for nonprofits at the city level, and then type in the name of your city, you might start finding some resources. And then all you need is a graphic design that um, can be made in different sizes, which is not hard to do in, um, in Canva and the tool that Katie mentioned. Um, so it's a really low cost way of just getting the message out there to everybody who uses transit. Kristen, do you, I, I stole your thunder and talked about your idea. Is there anything else that you would add to that? Gosh, I mean, on recruiting volunteers, what I hear just from the local program I work with here in Washington State is the best source of volunteers for them has been current volunteers. So starting with your current core veteran volunteers, you know, they are your best asset to they're a trusted messenger about the program when they talk to their friends and their community and their neighbors. Um, they are you know, going to be powerful people to explain what they're doing and why it matters and why it's rewarding and often end up recruiting um, others to apply as volunteers. So that's that's an excellent strategy, um, helping to support those volunteers in support them with messages that are simple about what what their job is why, you know, how it works um, is useful, giving the materials. I think somebody mentioned, do you have, you know, like flyers, like Katie was talking about, are there simple materials you can put in the hands of a volunteer so they can go out and sell the program? Um, I, I, I've, I've heard about efforts to, I think one of our st staff people actually was taking postcards and flyers to, you know, her church and other places in her community where um, she could, she could leave the materials, put posters up, all of that's really, it is time intensive and it's, you know, getting out there and pounding the pavement. But um, well, yeah, I, I wanted to back up and say, just thinking about your audience, because your audience, if it's other volunteers, if it's people who might want to volunteer, that's one audience. If it's residents, you know, that's a different audience. Are you talking to residents? You know, who do they trust? You know, and I think Katie had put in the questions, is it kind of a one size fits all? Do you put the same content everywhere? I would urge you not to do too much of that unless it's 
really a piece of information that's the same for all audiences, but really to think through who you're speaking to, where they get their information, who they trust to hear it from. So that whole, you know, voice of of peer to peer is really important. Sorry, I'm going. On. Well, I stop. I want to go back to the point about social media um, because exactly what Kristen is talking about is exactly what you can do on social media. So, for example, if you can give your volunteers sample posts and that they can post on their own social media feed. So less about your own feed, but more about um getting posts out to current volunteers who can share that on their own feeds and another way to kind of get that word of mouth um, spreading on social media and we've done this in a um in a clinic to get the word out about a community health center services that worked really really well was to at mention like tag a volunteer in one of your posts and then they'll get an alert that they've been tagged in this post and they'll share that with their friends and family. And so these at mentions are a great way, just, you know, it's just at and then the name of the person um, uh, or their handle on Twitter, if that's what you're using, depending on the platform. Um, make a post, tell their story, at mention them, and they are highly likely to share that with the people who trust them, you know, the people who they trust the most, their friends and family. That's a great idea. And I think that's really true. I think people like to be tagged in things and then they share it. Yeah. And also regarding volunteer recruitment, Amity put in the chat links to our website where there's other ideas for volunteer recruitment and getting people interested in the program. And a few other people put in what they're doing. So someone said um, AARP newsletters can be a good place to advertise the program. And then putting up flyers in your community and local churches. And then I also saw someone said, oh, magnetic signs, um, with, and they put them on their car. That's a nice way um, to advertise while you're driving around. So there's lots of ideas and creative things people have been doing. So if you're doing things like that, and I'm going to collect these that are in the chat, I will put them on our website, and you can look at our website and see what everyone's doing for recruitment. Um, so one question I have for Kristen and Katie which is also about promotion and getting the word about the program out there. Can you give more information about promoting the program through newspaper articles or like something that isn't online, but promoting the program through advertising in written text rather than social media? Sure, yeah, I'm a, of course a big fan of some people call it free media, where it's, you know, the media writing about you and your program and what's going on. I like to use the term earned media because it isn't, it, it's the cost of, that goes into doing that is, it is work, right? You have to take the time and help that reporter to, to figure out how to get this to be a story that's even going to make it past the editor's desk and, and for them to consider it newsworthy and something that you know would be meaningful for the whole community to see to see so putting some time into it earned um, media is a term I like to use and it's, thinking through how to do that effectively is a great bang for your buck though because you aren't paying for it and it is authentic and it's you know of course traditional media is smaller and smaller you can probably you're probably all aware of local papers closing in your state, um, it's getting smaller, harder and harder for them to make it. Uh, but if you do make it into the local media, whether it's the newspaper or local radio station or local TV station, you know, they have a big audience. Um, so it's a great way to go there. I am going to bring up that then paid is another option. And again, we're finding that because media is struggling to stay in business, they're sort of forcing you to pay for more things that they used to do for free. Um, so they might suggest, oh, well, we could you you could sponsor an article in the newspaper, you know, and I, I don't like that, but it's happening. It's a reality, right? So some of those places can be a pretty good bang for your buck. We have got some smaller media outlets out here in Washington State that are like weekly newspapers, and they also live online. So if you sponsor an article, say, for 
that article is going to come out that week in the printed edition. It's also going to live online on their homepage for sometimes a whole year. So it actually is a really great way to get content out there that um, can get a lot of eyeballs on it and be shareable. Um, so while it's not totally free, it's it's pretty good bang for your buck. Chris, so if somebody better. mentioned in the chat about PSAs, I just was going to say that that used to be the case that they would often do give you free airtime on the radio or TV. Again, I'm finding that to be less and less true just because they're struggling. So they're wanting you to pay to promote. But not to say it doesn't exist. It's worth a try calling your local radio and TV uh, stations and telling them who you are and what you do, asking for free space to, to do a quick PSA, like a 15 second or 30 second, you know, reader um, or video or message. Sorry, Katie, go ahead. I was going to say back to that sponsored content, who writes that and what makes it really good? You know, um, we can write it. And that's the thing is the, the paper might say, well, give us somebody to talk to and we'll write the article. So that's one way to do it where they'll maybe interview you and they'll write the paper, the article, or you could say, I'll write it. And they'll say, great, you know, what we need is you to have it be under 500 words. You can submit pictures, links, whatever you want with it, and then you can write it and get it, get it into them. So it gives you a lot of control over the message and the story. And like, say you want to feature a particular volunteer and resident interaction, you can take a picture of that and and provide that with the article. So it's it's a nice way to control the message where with the traditional media where they just decide to do a story, it's a little bit out of your control and you might not love the result afterwards. You might think, oh, they got it wrong or why did they talk to that person? They're our worst, <laughs> you know, whatever it might be, you have less control over it. And I saw someone said in the chat that there's um, newspapers or magazines that will print for free, like senior, center or chamber of commerce for nonprofits. They'll run things for free for nonprofits. So that's great. And I also, if anyone has questions for Kristen and Katie, feel free to ask them or you can type them in the chat or I can keep going down my questions for them. Well, I'm, I'm super curious to hear um, how other people have used social media um, to hear from this group about what has worked for you, what doesn't work. I mean, that's some of the most important things that you can learn on social media is what just doesn't work. And all social media is, is pattern recognition, right? You recognize that pictures work really, really well. Um, so then you just do more pictures or you realize that news articles just tank, nobody pays attention. So you don't do news articles, excuse me, news articles anymore. So I'm curious about what some of um, y'all have done that either works or doesn't that you've observed on social media. And feel free to unmute yourself or put it in chat. I don't think we can hear you, Lynn, but I see you're unmuted. Can you hear me if I talk? Fran Atkinson? Yep. Perfect. Yes. Uh, thanks. Good to be here today. I'm in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona. One thing that worked really well for us, one of our volunteers, terrific volunteer who had been with us for quite a while, she did a story about uh, a day in her life when she volunteers, what it's like when she goes into a facility, the lives that she touches. Uh, how effective she is speaking for them who don't have a voice and then how, how it makes her feel afterwards. And we had a big positive response from that. So that really helped. We use volunteer match. Uh, we also have had spots with the, uh, we've got in Arizona, Love and Life After 50, uh, a newspaper that comes out. We do uh, things in different neighborhoods where they have little publications. We put little ads. We've also had spots on the radio and have heard people say that they hear us. But usually a great thing too is, is uh, I tell our volunteers, you are ambassadors for our program, for them reaching out to other people. That helps a lot. I don't know if you guys can hear me now, is that better? Yes. All right, I have headphones now. <laughs> so what I started to say is that 
we really probably haven't harnessed as much social media as we we can, but I think a drawback for us is that we don't have an independent social media platform. We are tied to our Department of Aging media platforms through the county, and there is some vetting that um, goes through that, so we don't have an independent source. But listening today makes me say I got to push a little harder to find out how I could use those better because you're right, word of mouth seems to be the way that we've gotten things. We used to do a lot of old fashioned newspaper ads or postings in various uh, journals or retiree websites or things of that nature and it hasn't netted us um, that much. So we gotta bring our act into the 21st century and, and harness um, some of that. Um, piece of the puzzle. Not that this has to do with recruitment, but the one thing that we're struggling with is um, the certification process, which I think sometimes is a drawback for our volunteers staying engaged and focused in the very beginning. Of course, not once they get through it, but the process is lengthy. So we're, we're constantly asking on ourselves, how can we prune this? What can we do better? How can we bundle this? How can we make this as engaging as possible and not lose really good qualified um, volunteers? And I don't know that I have a good answer for it, but I'm really committed to seeing what does our industry think that it can do better to shorten that because that is a major stumbling block for the retention. And when we don't talk about those things, those are the white elephants in the room. We can spend all day marketing on how to get, you know, which, what pitch should we use? Which platform should we use? But if the certification process takes three months, four months, six months, eight months, it's a killer. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else? I was just going to add that it's definitely not a one size fits all, as I'm seeing in the comments here. You know, where you are, and yeah, you know, there's people working in big cities, people working in really small remote areas. You know, the media landscape is so different, in person events. It's all over the map. All of it's worth trying and just fi figure out what fits for you and your time and capabilities and where that where your audience is at. Really, how are you reaching your audience? I know um, in a more rural area of Washington State that's out in eastern Washington, we did kind of a one-two punch last spring. We We sort of promoted how much we are in urgent need of new volunteers and rebuilding our volunteer corps, like all of you are working on doing since the pandemic. Um, and paired that with, hey, reporter, you can come along on a visit, meet this, this volunteer who's getting trained, with, who's paired up with a, a, an alumni volunteer, you can go meet, follow them into the home, and of course it takes time, you've got to get permission from the facility to let them in, permission from the resident who's going to be um, featured in that story, and their family maybe, so getting all those permissions lined up, and then in that article, we paired it with, hey, can you also mention in the article that we're going to have a luncheon in the community in what I think it was only a week or 10 days away from that when it, the article published, where you can come and meet volunteers and staff and ask questions about this program if you're thinking about volunteering in the community. And that worked really well because people saw the article, they saw that there was a chance to go to an in-person event. And I think that in this small town, they had, I think, at least 12 or more people come to that event and a bunch of them apply to be volunteers so not one size fits all but trying you know to to uh, drive people to an in-person event through either traditional media story or through social media um, email getting volunteers to be your ambassadors and invite their friends and I would just pile on to what Kristen's saying about um getting people to talk to their friends. Um, uh, one thing that, and I saw somebody in the chat, I don't remember who it was, 
said something about using Facebook Live. So the great thing about Facebook Live is that it supersedes the algorithm. So if you um, follow a page, then you will get an alert no matter what that a Facebook Live is happening. So that is free advertising right there because as you know, a lot of your posts on social media get buried. But if you do this Facebook Live, then everybody who follows your page gets an alert about it. Um, and to Kristen's point of giving a tour of the facility or having people meet and greet, there are so many things that you can do with a live. You can take your just your cell phone, right? Just the camera on your phone and walk through the facility and give people a tour. Look, this is where we prepare meals or, you know, all of or this is where we have um, uh, different activities in the evenings. Um, interview a volunteer um, on a Facebook Live, right? So there are lots of ways that you can do exactly what um, you're talking about and what some other folks have mentioned in the chat to really beat the algorithm. I'm sorry, we're not supposed to say beat the algorithm. Work with the algorithm. Use the algorithm to your advantage to, um, to, uh, to get to the top of people's feeds. That's great. And so if you want to do something like that, I don't, do you have any tips on consent or confidentiality? How do you get permission from facilities to allow photos of the residents or of the facility in general? Any tips for that? It's complicated when you're dealing with a facility. I know that. Um, I think trying to keep it pretty focused and narrow maybe where you are actually getting written consent from specific people who are going to be in the photo shoot um, rather than blanket, you know, hey, can we walk around with a camera and anybody who happens, staff and, and residents are, that's a, that's a big ask and it's probably kind of impossible. Um, but just a written uh, photo permission consent form. Uh, we use some now that are really easy to create in Google forms that are just, you ask, you know, your name, your information, you describe what they're giving consent to do, to share your image for the purposes of promoting the ombudsman program. Maybe you even put a specific date frame in there. So it's not forever, but this year, do we have your permission to share your photo? Um, and you list the ways you want to use it. We want to put it on our website. We want to post it on social media. Um, this news outlet wants access to it. Um, so I'd be glad to, Katie, send you a an example of that kind of Google photo permission form you can use. Um, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. And I know we use a similar form in our work too when we're sharing photos of residents. I think that's really important to keep in mind, especially you know, the internet is forever. So you want to make sure people are okay with it. So yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions for Katie or Kristen or any comments? Anything that's working well in your state or that you need help with that maybe Kristen and Katie can provide expertise in? while you're thinking, and maybe you're typing it in the chat. Um, one question I have is, so if we're doing all of this, we're using our website and our listserv and our social media, but our network is only as big as it is. So how do we promote our content and partner with other organizations to leverage their audiences um, and other organizations or local media to get more eyes on our stuff? rather than just posting it out to the same people over and over again. I have two, but Kristen, it looks like you have, I have two things and Kristen, it looks like you have something to say too. So I'll let you go first because this is one I get really excited about and we'll talk about for the rest of the time. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> no, quickly. And I think somebody already mentioned it, which was pair, pairing up with, teaming up with like-minded sort of organizations that have a big reach. So somebody mentioned AARP. You know, they have a huge list in most states of members, and they are often willing to go ahead and, and include, right, an article about what you're doing in their newsletter that might go out on email, might be a printed newsletter that ends up in people's mailboxes. They have a uh, website 
So having partnering with them, and I, again, I've, we've done that a couple of times here in Washington in the last year, and it always results in a huge spike of visitors to the website um, and applications and interest and in, in, from volunteers, potential volunteers. So that's just one example of partner with people who do have a big following and a big reach and ask them to carry your content. Well, and that's my question is how many, and again, feel free to unmute or type in the chat, how many, um, one thing I don't know about uh, the programs in different states, how many organizations do you have partnerships with, you know, like, um, like AARP or other senior services um, centers, how connected are you with organizations like with other partner organizations, because this will help define my answer. The, the partnerships might be informal too, not formal. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, you know that you have relationships with the area agencies on aging, um, or other, you know, or people have mentioned the Lions Club. Mm -hmm. That's that's another great organization, or Rotary Church organizations. One of the things that um, state and county agencies, yeah, state and county agencies. One of the things that um, I did when we were trying to change the conversation around a health issue, right? It was it's it was controversial and we were trying to change the conversation around it. So we got a group of like-minded organizations together and just had got them on a call and had them talk about um messaging that they could use, kind of like this, right? Messaging that they could use. And then they all posted it at the same time with the same messaging, the same types of pictures, the same hashtags. And that way your audience is seeing it from all sides and they remember it because it's the same thing over and over and over and over again. To cut through the noise, people need to see your message 20 times, right? But if they are seeing different content, then they're not going to remember it. They need to see the same content or similar. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. It should be tailored to each, pro, uh, to each uh, platform. But if they're seeing the same type of content, the same pictures, the same hashtags, that's how they're going to remember it. So even if you can't get on a call and talk to people about it, say in your own office, you distribute those beautiful flyers that you made on Canva um, and ask all of the people in your coalition to, uh, not in your coalition, in your partners, um, within your partners, to post those too. And then you start creating this kind of, uh, I, I don't want to say echo chamber because it's the opposite of that. Um, but they can't get away from your content, right? And so they really start remembering it. Um, another thing, if Kristen had mentioned about paid, and so, um, again, I'm, I'm talking about primarily social media, and I know not everybody uses that, so I'll, I, I won't spend too much time on it. But if you do have about $100, $100 in one month to boost some of your content, that gets you out of um, the audience that you are already talking to, right, who might be interested in this. My biggest recommendation for that, the thing that's going to make that successful is not to create new content to boost. Look through your feed and see what's already working. What piece of content in your feed is already getting the most shares? That's going to be your most valuable, right? Because that's people sharing it with the people that they care about. So which piece of content is getting the most shares and then put money behind that one, a small amount of money behind that one, because if it's getting shares organically, it will get shares when you're paid for it. So that's just kind of an automatic way to, um, to push that content out more and get some more virality. I'll leave it, I'll leave it there because I know not everybody does social and not everybody has that money to spend. That's great, yeah, that's helpful. It's, you don't wanna put money behind something that you don't know will do well already without any money so so if you don't have a lot of time and you don't have a lot of money 
what are things that I can do that are the biggest bang for your buck when communicating online? Like where should we put our energy to strategize the focus of most of our efforts? I think it depends on where your audience is. Like what is the age range of the people that you're trying to reach? Um, uh, like if it is maybe an older group, then they frequently follow local blogs. Um, so doing that sponsored content or trying to get some um, content into not local blogs, but local local newspaper blogs. So they're re- not n- local blogs, local newspaper blogs. Like I am dedicated to reading the West Seattle blog. I read it nonstop because it has to do with my neighborhood, right? So and it's pretty easy to get that um, to get them to sponsor content if it has to do with something within the community. So I think that's a really great way is to go to the places where you know people are. You know, it's a it's a younger age, it's an older age range that's on Facebook. I think right now it's between the ages, oh, it changes all the time. I think right now it's between the ages of 30 and 45, but do not quote me on that, um, are the ages of people who are on Facebook right now. So if that's the audience that you're trying to reach, that is a good place to go. Um, if you have news to share, 70% of Twitter users get all of their news from Twitter. So it's a great place. If you get one of these sponsored articles like Kristen is talking about, or you get an article in one of these local paper blogs, put that on Twitter. If you have a Twitter account, right? You might not. And that's fine too, right? You don't need to start one. But if you do have one, um, that's a great place to put news articles. So I think it really depends on where your audience um, is online. Kristen, what would you add? Yeah, I feel like I keep going back to this AARP um, partnership, just getting content there, just because, again, thinking about our audience, who is it that are currently volunteers and that likely, you know, in that age range where they'd have time to volunteer, interest in volunteering, and that they're, they're hitting that target, right? Their, their audience are people 55 plus, um, often with either nearing retirement or having more time on their hands. And so it's just a really ripe audience. So, and, and it doesn't take that much time to sort of just reach out, partner with them, ask if you can write a quick article, or they might be willing to help you put one together. These are super short. We're not talking about, you know, 2000 words. It's half page, super short with an image and a link. And you can't overdo it. Like Katie was saying, if they offer to carry a regular column, you know, every month, every uh, four times a year, twice a year, as often as you can, um, you're not going to bring people out. You're just going to remind them that you're there. Maybe they thought the first time, oh, I'll look into that. And then they don't. And the second time they see it. Okay. That reminds me, I was going to look into that. So don't be afraid of spamming people with that kind of effort. And I, I do think back to Katie O'Hearn, your question about you don't have much time or resources. That's the kind of investment that's probably going to pay off a lot is just helping to get in a vehicle, a, a communications channel that is really likely to hit the audience you're trying to reach. Um, yeah. What about what about the folks on this call? Like what's using what's working for all of you guys? And I'm working at the same time. And I'm, huh? I think that might've been an accident. Does anyone have anything that's working that they're using? Or that you wanna try. And I know in the chat, it says, um, someone asked, do you have any specific suggestions for LinkedIn? I know we've talked about Facebook and Twitter, but LinkedIn could be a place to add an opportunity to volunteer. Yeah, it can be. LinkedIn is an uh, audience of, of professionals primarily, so they, prob- they, um, do, they do not have as much time as somebody who is retired, but um, uh, that, that doesn't mean that they're not working part-time, right, and are looking for opportunities. And again, it is that at mentioning. Um, There are also groups on LinkedIn. And so if you can find some groups of people who are looking to give back to their community, I don't know those groups off the top of my head, but you can just do a search 
for groups of people who want to give back to the community, join those groups and start participating in them. And that's my best tip for LinkedIn is to get into those groups and it, it just um, engage, like don't just lurk, but actually provide some helpful information, inspiring information, and, um, and um, information that, uh, that's mission oriented, right? That, that, that talks about your values and about your mission because people like to be seen as people who have really strong values. And so they're likely to, if, if you write the content for them as a post, they're more likely to share it because it makes them look really good to the people in their community. Yeah, going off of that, I think somebody just, Jesse just posted about um, volunteers sometimes want some recognition mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, and absolutely that's powerful content to highlight volunteers themselves and have them speak for themselves. Not, not It's not us talking about them, it's them talking about themselves. So that first person voice. Um, again, I've worked with volunteers and I, I just interview them and write down everything they're saying. And then it's under their own name. They basically publish, you know, a guest column in their own name. Why I why I'm interested in long term care? Why I volunteered? What I somebody was mentioning earlier? Describe a life in the day of being an omb a volunteer ombuds. And what do I get out of it? What's rewarding? What's challenging? Why would I encourage you in another person in my community who's thinking about volunteering to choose this one, this opportunity over others? So that first person voice is really great. Um, and while stock photography is great, it's option, it's out there for creating materials. If folks can get jump through that those extra hurdles to get actual pictures of actual volunteers and actual video of actual volunteers in action, it's super powerful. Um, and I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, I agree. I think real people always tend to do better than these photos that you can tell are a photo shoot so but it is harder to get the real photos um, so I know we're coming near the end so I just want to ask Kristen and Katie for what is your one piece of advice your last any last tidbit you want to leave everyone with before we close out um, yeah anything like that I'll go Kristen because this is the advice I give everybody I train people um around the world on this stuff. And the thing that always works the best is trying things, experiment, see what works and see what doesn't work. But just have a curious mindset of, oh, I wonder what would happen if I tried this thing. Well, then try it, you know, and then if it works, fantastic. If it doesn't work, who cares, right? Social media is one of the best places to fail because what failure means is that nobody saw it. So it's the best place to fail because it means nobody saw you fail, right? So that's a fantastic place to try some things and experiment with some things. But really just have that mindset of, I want to explore, I'm curious about this, and I'm willing to just try it. I couldn't agree more. I'm going to echo that. Just try it, just try it, just try it. Um, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, reaching out to media and reporters even if it doesn't always result in a story and it won't, I'm warning you, just because it doesn't, doesn't mean you are a failure. There's just a million reasons why it might not result in what you'd like to see. You're constantly, keep up that steady drumbeat of outreach, become a resource so that when there is a story that involves long-term care, they're gonna turn to you. You know, we recently, we get calls, hey, oh, they're lifting the mask mandate in long-term care, what do you think about that? Well, we can answer that question or not. We can try to be a resource to that reporter about that story. And it's another opportunity to remind them, you know, what really is urgent and what I really need, you know, what we're trying to get the word about is this other thing. So use every opportunity to talk to a reporter, whether they're coming to you or you're going to them. That's not always going to work, but keep trying it. And um, we're here to support you. If you're thinking about doing it, you're nervous, you want to run it by somebody, you've got a draft press release or a story pitch or a volunteer says, yeah, I'd be willing to do this, but I'm a little nervous. I've never talked to a reporter before. Give us a call. We can help coach them through it. Yeah. 
Thank you. That's both great advice. And we all want to be here to support. And Carol put in the chat, if you're not already a part of it, we have a volunteer management listserv. So if you have questions about managing volunteers, um, you can add it to the listserv. So just email Carol and she'll add you to the list to be a part of that. So thank you all. Thank you, Kristen and Katie, for being here. And I appreciate your expertise. Great to be with you all. Yeah, thanks okay. for having us. All right. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Yeah. Bye. Bye.